Hi, my name is Horace Halston, and I want to welcome you to the video and podcast ministry of Rosemark First Presbyterian Church in Rosemark, Tennessee. Hear now our call to worship. O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. You are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted, and they were not put to shame. Amen. Let us worship Almighty God. Let us now join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to share with you today on the topic of proclaim his deliverance. And I find my inspiration in two verses in particular. First, verse 30 and 31, verses 30 and 31 of Psalm 22. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. And secondly, Mark 8, 34. If any want to become my followers, Jesus said, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Let us continue our worship as we read together our two scripture lessons. First, Psalm 22, verses 23 to 31. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All ye offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Amen. Here ends our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures. To God's name 
be the glory and the praise. Turning now to the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I'm reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. Listen again for the Word of God. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he, meaning Jesus, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their crosses and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Amen. Here ends our reading from God's holy word. To God be the glory and the praise. I want to share with you today on the topic proclaim his deliverance. Uh, but first, my research team has been hard at work once again, providing me with some crucial insights about modern life that I can share with you. And I know your hearts are beating faster as I announce this rare privilege to have these insights. Mom went through a tropical food craze. There was fruit all over the house. It was enough to make a man go crazy. <laughs> Think about it, you'll get it. Why did the mathematician get so fat? Because he ate too much pie. <laughs> Did you hear about the kidnapping? Hmm? Did you hear? He's fine. He eventually woke up. <laughs> okay. Proclaim his deliverance. Proclaim his deliverance. The Dutch spiritual writer Henri J. Nouwen once wrote, the first thing that Jesus promises is suffering. I tell you, you will be weeping and wailing and you will be sorrowful. But he calls these pains birth pains. And so what seems a hindrance becomes a way. What seems an obstacle becomes a door. And what seems a misfit becomes a cornerstone. Jesus changes our history from a random series of sad incidents and accidents into a constant opportunity for change of heart. 
the famous Oxford Don who became a spokesman for the Christian faith during and shortly after World War II, namely C.S. Lewis, is probably most famous today for his writing of the book Mere Christianity. Lewis also once wrote about the role of suffering in the Christian life. The Oxford scholar said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pains, but shouts to us in our pains. It is his megaphone to raise a deaf world, to rouse a deaf world. The minister who was my father in Christ once told me the story about his going to visit a deeply spiritual woman uh, who was a member of his church. She was in the hospital. She showed every sign of being near to death because of a painful and quickly spreading cancer. God has trusted you with this terrible illness, the minister tried to say. He was quickly interrupted. You know, Reverend, sometimes I wish he didn't trust me quite so much. I wish he didn't trust me quite so much. On this second Sunday of that season of the Christian year known as Lent, we have found ourselves once again examining a psalm. Last week, we focused intensely on Psalm 25 under the rubric, Teach Me we discovered how the purpose of Psalm 25 was to be a model prayer. We also discovered how much we as Christians need to learn what only God, only God can teach us. In our Lenten prayers, we need to seek such learning, ask for such learning, and cherish such learning. Today we are about to examine Psalm 22, and once again we will be looking at a psalm that is also a model prayer. In this prayer, we will soon see how the third and last of three sections celebrated the possibility of God's deliverance and redemption in the midst of suffering. The fact that Jesus quoted the first verse of this psalm, Psalm 22, while he was dying on the cross, an experience of physical and spiritual suffering beyond anything you and I might ever have, indicated Jesus' faith in his deliverance. Jesus Christ did not flee his suffering, avoid his suffering, or escape his suffering. He even promised a penitent thief who was dying on the cross next to Jesus that he would soon join Jesus in the kingdom of God. The author of Hebrews described Jesus' sufferings when he wrote, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Bible scholar James L. Mays has pointed to the famous cry of dereliction found in Mark 15, 34, 
that Jesus shouted from the cross as he hung there, slowly dying. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That cry was actually the first verse of Psalm 22. Mays used that to justify his claim that Psalm 22 has supreme importance for believers who want to discover the deepest levels of meaning involved in Jesus' crucifixion. Psalm 22 as a whole took the form of a prayer for help. That is to say, it recorded the keen suffering and deadly travail of a person who was looking death in the eye. The first two parts of the psalm describe the pain and the desperation the suppliant, suppliant is one who makes supplications a form of prayer to God, the suppliant experienced. Then the third of three, the three parts of the psalm suddenly changed to enthusiastic praise and thanksgiving when that same individual embraced the expectation of a God-given deliverance from his ordeal. The 16th century Presbyterian reformer John Calvin was one of the more famous students of the scriptures who recognized the fact that the suffering of the one who prayed the psalm, who prayed in Psalm 22, seemed far greater, far greater than any suffering King David might have experienced. The psalmist was scorned and despised. If you're following along in your Bible, that's in verse 6. The psalmist was the target of mockery and head shakes, verse 7. The psalmist was taunted with a suggestion to let the Lord rescue the one in whom he delights, verse 8. The psalmist felt encircled by wild bulls, verse 12, and threatened by a ravening and roaring lion, verse 13, repeated in verse 21. The psalmist felt surrounded by a company of evildoers, verse 16, who gloated, gloated over his physical deterioration and the way his hands and feet had shriveled. In what has been recognized as a foreshadowing of Jesus' experience on the cross, we can also read the psalmist's lament, they divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. That was in verse 18. And you can find the record of something similar in the crucifixion in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 24. Therefore, on the basis of Jesus' quotation of Psalm 22, verse 1, and the basis of the parallel gambling for the psalmist's clothes, In Psalm 22, 18, Calvin, John Calvin, claimed the agonized sense of abandonment and suffering that the psalmist recorded was more in keeping with the experience of Christ on the cross. He seemed to have admitted, however, that King David might not have realized the full application of his words. Bible scholar John Golden Gay has written, throughout it, meaning the psalm, the psalm alternates between questions, protests, and laments on the one hand, and acknowledgement of Yahweh, statements of faith 
in Yahweh and prayers to Yahweh on the other. The theme of the possibility, efficacy, and necessity of giving praise to God runs through the whole psalm. Verses 22 to 31, our actual scripture reading this morning, do not indicate that the suppliant has yet experienced Yahweh's deliverance. They do indicate, those verses do indicate that the suppliant knows, knows Yahweh will deliver. Our third section of Psalm 22, which is under our special purview this morning, described three forms of adoration which God's people could in their prayer direct toward the Creator. God's people were to praise Him, to glorify Him, and to stand in awe of Him. See verse 23 of the psalm. To praise God, according to the online dictionary.com, means, quote, the act of expressing approval or admiration, commendation, laudation, the offering of grateful homage in words or song as an act of worship, a hymn of praise to God. I want to suggest this morning that the authentic praise of God involves the nature, the nurture, and the encouragement of a worshiping community. God's love has many expressions. God's blessings have many forms. And God's truth offers many insights. The psalmist affirmed how his praise found expression in what he called the great congregation Verses 25 to 26. When a congregation lifts their voice and prays to God, the result is a dramatic synergy, a flowing together of many expressions of gratitude. This can be true in the singing of glorious hymns or in something as simple as the singing of the doxology. To glorify God meant to recognize and celebrate the excellence of God's nature, the beauty and inspiration of God's holiness, the generosity of God's love, who gave his only Son for us on the cross, and the wisdom and timing of God's providence. Even the wisest and strongest among us are like little children when compared to God's glory, majesty, and strength. To stand in awe of God is a powerful form of reverence that can recognize the mystery and the wonder of God's loving work in our lives, in our church, and also in our community. Awe is an overwhelming emotional experience that recognizes how God is not, how God is not the absentee watchmaker who started us ticking and then turned his or her back. All recognizes that God is present and at work to do what we cannot do by ourselves and to bless us in ways that startle and surprise us. Despite all his suffering, the exhortation of his fellow believers to praise God, to glorify God, and to stand in awe of God meant that the psalmist believed in and trusted in God. To hold both realities, the positive and the negative, simultaneously in mind, revealed an amazing spirituality. And it was exactly that kind of amazing spirituality that empowered Jesus to model for us 
following the way of the cross, and entrusting life to Almighty God. Jesus said, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. May each of us during this Lenten season praise, glorify, and feel all before God, even as we struggle with the cross we have been called to bear. And let us all pray to keep growing in our faith and our ability to trust the Lord as we rejoice and proclaim the promise of our ultimate deliverance. Amen. To God be the glory and the praise. Receive now, if you will, the benediction of our Lord. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you and all of you this day and forevermore. Amen.